Welcome to the second quarter Westpath webinar. My name is Joe Halwax, Managing Director of Westpath's Institutional Investments Team, and I'm coming to you from our offices here in Glenview, Illinois. Thank you for joining us today. It feels like there are no more quiet quarters or three-month periods where very little happens, both in markets and in our personal lives. Q2 2022 was another memorable quarter. In the second quarter, we saw volatile markets stemming from the unique and unpredictable events surrounding COVID and the continuation of the Ukraine war that started on February 24th. This has been a tumultuous quarter for markets that has started with a strong reaction to rising inflation, which weighed heavily on both stocks and bonds. We ended the quarter with inflation potentially near its peak and the biggest concern shifting to a potential recession. While recessions are never enjoyable, currently an economic cooldown is needed to tame inflation, and any recessionary period may be short lived. Suffice to say, these are interesting and challenging times for investors. It's hard to know what the future will look like, which helps explain why markets remain so volatile amid this uncertainty. On a somber note, Westpath is roughly 12 miles from Highland Park, Illinois, where the tragic events of the July 4th shooting occurred. With members of our staff in and around this town, the physical and emotional impact of this tragedy is close to home. We are strong in our resolve and our support for those affected through this difficult Today you'll hear a brief organizational update, then Jake Burnett will cover our work in sustainable investments. I'll update you on the markets. My coll colleague Evan Wachowski will review the performance of our funds, and Dave Zellner will close it out with an economic update. This quarter, we welcome Andrew Stevens to our investments team. Andrew joins Westpath as an investment analyst on our investment an analytics team. This is the team that analyzes, monitors, and evaluates investment portfolios and asset manager performance as well as provides risk management and oversight of our investment program. With such a busy quarter comes a lot of blog posts. Most recently, I provided a year-to-date market review, and my colleague Frank Holstein explained the historical relationship between negative consumer sentiment and above average market returns. To read both of these blog posts, as well as many other blogs, please visit our website. With us now is Jake Barnett, Westpath Director of Sustainable Investment Stewardship. Thanks for joining me, Jake. Always happy to sit down with you, Joe. Recently, Jake, your team has been conducting engagement with different stakeholders, including some of our institutional clients. It'd be great to hear more about what your team's goals are in that area. Sure. Well, first off, it all starts with our sustainable economy framework. As we work towards a sustainable global economy, we recognize that there is not one universal opinion about what the path towards social cohesion, long-term prosperity for all, or environmental health looks like. Thus, we seek to engage the diverse members of the church to better understand their unique viewpoints and perspectives to inform our approach. During this process, we've appreciated the feedback we've received from many of our institutional investors. Looking at this slide, there are four distinct steps to our stakeholder engagement work. The first is relational. We seek to connect and build relationships with different stakeholders. Numbers two and three are related in that these conversations can inform and provide valuable feedback to how we pursue engagements. For example, we have been seeking to engage with stakeholders in Africa that we are connected to through the church to inform our engagements on child labor in that region. Finally, we hope to lift up and empower different voices in the church to give them a role in guiding our efforts to build momentum towards a sustainable economy framework. We have three goals in building a robust sustainable stakeholder engagement methodology. The first is to continue to position ourselves in our field uh, as leaders that are informed by diverse perspectives. The second is to educate and engage stakeholders to build understanding and support for the sustainable economy framework. Lastly, we hope that all of this helps us better align with the values and goals of the diverse Methodist community that we serve. Jay, can you elaborate on a topic that you're engaging with stakeholders on right now? One good example of that, Joe, is our engagement with Caterpillar. Working with partners at Heartland Initiative, we heard about problematic, problematic aspects of Caterpillar's operations, specifically in conflict-affected and high-risk areas, such as the occupied Palestinian territories and the Uyghur Autonomous Region of China. 
We built a coalition of investors representing over $2 trillion in assets who sought to engage with the company on these topics, but unfortunately the company was not initially interested in engaging. We thus decided to file a shareholder resolution asking for more transparency on how the company seeks to moderate and mitigate risks for its operations in conflict affected and high risk areas. You can read more about our rationale in my colleague Sharagacharya's blog, which is available on our website. Now, the resolution only received approximately 10% of investor support, which, while not as high as we would like, will allow us to refile next year, at which point we will increase our efforts to build the vote by educating other investors on the importance of this issue. That's great, Jake. In addition to some of the stakeholder and traditional engagement work, the SIS team has been, uh, has been in contributed to the release of a, of a paper that got the attention of the sustainable investing community. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, Joe. That's a favorite project of mine. So the paper was co-authored by myself and my co-lead for the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance engagement track, Patrick Para, and was titled The Future of Investor Engagement. In the paper, we argue that for topics that have broad impacts across the entire economy, like the transition to net zero or income inequality, engaging individual companies is a necessary but not sufficient foundation for investors. After outlining some of the limits of corporate engagement, we go on to argue for the need for stronger systemic stewardship using tools like sector engagement, public policy engagement, and in particular for asset owners like Westpath, a familiar topic will be the need to engage our asset owners to ensure alignment of our long-term systemic big picture interests. And Jake, how was the paper received by the investor community? Happy to share that we got a very positive response. The paper was covered in multiple media sources, including Bloomberg, and Patrick and I were also invited to a prominent sustainable investing podcast called Talking Responsibly. So if any of you are nerdy about that out there, please go and check it out. On this slide, we have also a collection of quotes from well-respected leaders in sustainable investing, talking about how this paper represents an important contribution to the future of investor engagement. My team feels privileged in our role at Westpath to be able to contribute and help lead global conversations on important issues on behalf of the church. We will continue to aim to do so. Thanks for the update, Jake. Thanks, Joe. Welcome to the market update for the second quarter. During our last update in April, we noted that a high level of market uncertainty was expected, exacerbated by the war in Ukraine and soaring inflation. While inflation has been the most watched theme, we're now witnessing weakness in consumer sentiment and in commodities. Combine this with lower yields indicates that the market is moving from fears of inflation to fears of a significant economic slowdown or recession. Dave will talk more about this shortly, so I'll just point out that this is reflected in the market for the quarter and for the first half of the year. As you can see, this is an extremely difficult start to the year, with the only two asset classes showing positive returns being cash and commodities. The S&P 500 lost 20% in the first half of the year, and international stocks, represented by the MSCI EFI index, lost 19.6%. Bonds also struggled this quarter, with the Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index losing 10.3%. To put this in perspective, research from Deutsche Bank shows that this is the worst start to the bond market since 1788. Yes, you heard that right, over 200 years ago. This has effectively been the worst start to the bond market in history. For long-term investors with balanced portfolios, like most of Westpath's clients, this resulted in the worst performance for a traditional balanced portfolio since the great financial crisis in 2008. Looking at a traditional 60-40 portfolio using the S&P 500 and the Bloomberg aggregate, the 2022 year-to-date loss is 16.1%. The worst full-year performance in the last 45 years was negative 20.1% in 2008 we've already reached 16% in just six months. You can see from the chart, it's very rare to have double digit losses in a balanced portfolio. Typically stocks and bonds are negatively correlated or at least uncorrelated, so they will not move in the same direction. What's different this time is very high inflation, which we've not experienced at this level for 40 years. To combat inflation, interest rates rise, which in turn causes bond prices to fall and results in negative returns. Higher rates makes equities less attractive, especially growth stocks. And remember, 
Growth stocks have led U.S. markets higher for the last decade. Higher rates will slow the economy, which is needed, but also weigh on earnings and consumption, and it's a big headwind for stocks. This helps explain why current market conditions are rare, where bonds do not offer protection in a diversified portfolio. It also explains why central banks fear inflation. Let's review the bond market and yield curve reaction to the sharp rise in inflation. To start the year, the two-year yield stood at 73 basis points. By the end of June, the two-year yield had risen by 2.35%, a significant move in just 90 days. Looking at the yield curve from the bottom blue line to the orange top line, that represents a difference that we've seen over the last six months. We saw very sharp moves higher in the short end, up 2% out three years, and 1.3% in 30-year rates, resulting in bond losses across all maturities. While the losses from the bond market are palpable for the first half, bonds are much more attractive today than they were at the start of the year. An investor has a year of 3% on a 10-year bond, and that's double the 1.5 from the start of the year. The Fed hiked rates 50 basis points on May 4th and 75 basis points on June 15th to a new range of 1.5 to 1.75%. There is an additional 200 basis points priced into the futures market for the rest of 2022, including another 75 to 100 basis points in July. Looking at the green line in this chart, the market is already pricing in Fed rate cuts for 2023. This is because the market is forward looking and already predicting that the economy will slow and inflation will come down to the point where the Fed will switch to easing next year. This is a positive sign and suggests that even as we live through this volatility, the imbalances are being adjusted and we will see growth after this short term turmoil. One way to look at how the market is adjusting is to look at five year break even rates, which are real time estimates from yield curves on future inflation. We had peak five-year inflation expectations in April of 3.6%. At the end of June, it's down to 2.6%. If inflation expectations continue to ease, it's possible that the Fed will not have to hike by the further 200 basis points currently priced in. And this would be a positive for asset prices. I want to look at two equity market graphs for some perspective. We frequently show this chart on the screen. And this shows the S&P 500 performance over time. You'll see that the gray bars represent calendar year returns and the red dots show the largest intra-year peak to trot drawdown. For 2022, the performance is through June. Since 1980, the average return on the S&P 500 was 13%. However, during the year, on average, there is a peak to trot decline of 14%. So this is a great visual reminder that drawdowns are completely normal. And in order to achieve overall positive long-term performance, an investor needs to assume some level of short-term risk. Another factor related to equities in this drawdown is that valuations have come down considerably. While no one ever wants to see double-digit losses in the first six months of a year, stocks are much more reasonably priced when looking at traditional metrics. One measure we consider when looking at how cheap or expensive the market is is the forward price to earnings ratio. After peaking near 23 at the end of 2020, this ratio now stands at just under 16, which is sharply lower and also below the long-term average of 16.85. While I reported some ugly market results for the first half of 2022, I want to try and end on a positive note. Recent commentary for Dr. David Kelly of JP Morgan Asset Management notes that since 1946, the average recession has lasted for 10 months, and the average expansion has lasted for over five years. Again, while recessions are challenging, historically they are short-lived. While the economy and markets have been somewhat unnerving for the past 18 months, this is the period of post-COVID adjustment. Imbalances are being resolved, and we're also adapting to a new normal, including hybrid work and more resilient supply chains. We believe that the U.S. and the world will resolve current challenges and that economic growth will continue. I want to welcome a member of the client team that many of you know, Evan Witkowski. Evan's going to cover fund attribution today. Evan, welcome. It's great to have you here. Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me this time around. I've never dreamt of being on the big screen, so this is a bit special for me. 
But enough with the introductions, let's get on to performance. The first chart shows the net of all fee performance of the individual Westpath composites versus their respective market indices. Today I'm going to focus primarily on the second quarter performance and also highlight the year-to-date fund returns. Joe, I know you mentioned recently that this has been the second worst year of a 60-40 balance fund going back to 1977. If this is the second worst year, I have to believe this ranks as one of the worst quarters for a balance fund. Yeah, and so one of my former colleagues named John Havites up at DVG Solutions in Minneapolis, he posted some research showing that this is the worst calendar year start to a 60-40 since 1932. Wow. Despite negative absolute returns, the multiple asset composite then outperformed its benchmark by a modest six basis points net of fees for the quarter. The U.S. equity composite underperformed its benchmark by about 41 basis points. We will talk a little bit more about this later, but the international equity composite just inched out by one basis point against its benchmark. The two bond funds that comprise 35% of our multiple asset composite were split against their benchmarks. For example, the fixed income composite underperformed by 64 basis points, and the inflation protection fund outperformed its benchmark by a whopping 3.35%. Looking at the year-to-date performance, the multiple asset composite's biggest detractor was the international equity. If you look long-term, it is actually outperforming its benchmark across the three-year time periods and longer. So Evan, can you tell me how the multiple asset fund has performed historically during and following a market downturn? Great question. The next slide may look familiar as we often show this drawdown chart with the S&P 500. This exhibit showcases the multiple asset fund, which has history back to 2002, of which we can make several observations. Despite average intra-year declines of 10% since 2004, annual returns for the multiple asset composite were positive in 14 of the 18 years. As of June 30th, 2022, we are of course in a drawdown period of negative 19%. Historically, the multiple asset fund has experienced larger drawdowns such as during the pandemic period, negative 25% in March of 2020, and during the global financial crisis, negative 39% in March of 2009. The performance rebound and recovery period took 20 months following the global financial crisis, but only four months following the pandemic-induced drawdown. So Evan, are drawdowns common? Great question. People use the analogy that markets can be roller coasters. Yes, drawdowns are common, but the multiple asset fund has always recovered. Since 2004, the multiple asset fund has experienced double-digit intra-year drawdowns in six calendar years prior to 2022. While in only two of these six years, the fund ended the year in positive territory, in all six years, it generated positive returns the year following a double-digit drawdown, with an average return of 15%. It's important to remember, too, that the fund is a well-diversified strategy among many different asset classes, managers, and styles. As in any market cycle, the leaders will sometimes be laggards. When we did this webinar a year ago, our three-year performance was in the 26th percentile and everything beyond was in the top quartile. So according to one of our managers, Wellington, 80% of asset managers fall below the median of a universe on a rolling three-year basis at some point. Underperformance happens. As both an asset manager and an asset owner, this makes us think twice about abandoning our long-term strategy. Looking now at the one-year multiple asset fund composite, it's in the 91st percentile. However, the three, five, and 10-year are still above the, above the median as compared with its balanced fund peers. Thanks, Evan. So why don't we move on to attribution? Happy to, Joe. So looking at this next slide, the multiple asset fund underperformed by two basis points in a quarter when three of the four underlying funds underperformed. This gives me reassurance that the diversification in the multiple asset composite can help. Now, we will spend time discussing each underlying fund's performance. I want to begin with our U.S. equity fund by highlighting a new segment we created called Unscripted, a conversation with Westpath's asset managers. This quarter, our manager of public equities, Mark Warren, did a segment with Brown Capital Management. If you'd like to hear more, please head to westpath.com or connect with a member of our servicing team for more details. The U.S. equity fund saw its worst quarter since I began at Westpath in early 2020. 
In an environment where no major equity markets are doing well, there are still some things to look forward to. So what should, what should investors be optimistic for in the stock market? Great question. But before I get into what investors should be hopeful about, every month during the second quarter was in the red. April and June were down negative 9% and 8.9%, while May was slightly negative. While from 2019 to 2021, mega cap stocks dominated markets, on the upside, our belief in maintaining an underweight to mega caps contributed to relative performance, along with the diversification we bring through our alternative investments, including private real estate and private equity. These investments contributed about 0.9% to the relative return, while only making up about 6% of the portfolio. Secondly, Investors are benefiting now from the diversification from value stocks, which comprises 56% of our portfolio and have been outperforming growth year to date. Lastly, we regularly meet with our managers about their sentiment. Going forward, one comment that stood out to me was from our manager, DGI, who said, periods like these allow us to set up the portfolio well for strong return potential going forward. So and then what's been hurting the portfolio? Well, when the Federal Reserve increases the Fed funds rate, it immediately elevates short-term borrowing costs for financial institutions. Businesses are not only affected by higher borrowing rates, but also consumer demand for their products can slow as costs increase. Because of the effects of interest rates on growth stocks, our overweight to small and mid-cap growth was a detractor. Applying the interest rate concept to our growth manager, Zevin Bergen, we learned that in periods of underperformance, they not only bounce back, but they find companies with rare compounding ability. Let me provide an example of this. Tesla, down 38% for the quarter. However, it is up 12,180% over the past 10 years. Compare that to the S&P 500, which is up 233% over that same period. Additionally, our long-term focus enables us to wait out companies that will create value over the long term. So let's shift gears. How about uh, international equities? Well, let me begin by stating that this quarter, April and June were down negative 7.5% and 8.3%. Not as bad as on the US side, but again, let me remind everyone that almost every major asset class was down for the quarter. In essence, there was nowhere to hide unless you had a barrel of oil to sell. Alts contributed about 84 basis points to the relative return while making up about 5% of the portfolio. So then on the downside, aren't rates hurting our growth managers in this portfolio? Yes, and I should say underperformance is slight, but e-commerce didn't do well, which is a direct result of these growth companies being out of favor as the central banks across the world raise rates to combat global inflation. One of our longest standing international managers, Bailey Gifford is a highly regarded investment manager based in Edinburgh, Scotland, following, founded in 1908. Bailey follows a growth-oriented investment approach, which leads to a portfolio that tends to be more volatile than the overall market and its benchmark. One such company that detracted was Zalando, down 50% in the second quarter. They engage in the provision of online fashion, and it's also a lifestyle platform. It offers shoes, apparel, accessories, and beauty products. I think we hear about growth companies at times not earning any income, well, Zalando had a positive net income in 2021 and is also projected to earn 91 million euros as of year end, according to FactSet. Another company that Bailey has held for more than 10 years is Mercado Libre, down 46% in the second quarter. It has suffered seven drawdowns of more than 30%, but it's generated a 17x return over our holding period. The key to our managers like Bailey is that we rely on them to find companies that are in the top quartile of earners Lastly, I just want to mention that Mark Warren, again, as part of our unscripted series, interviewed Lawrence Burns of Bailey Gifford. There are three main things to highlight. First is that agency commercial mortgage-backed securities are 10% overweight against the benchmark, and our manager was down 3% for the quarter. These are shorter duration, less sensitive to interest rate changes, and higher quality because these are backed by government agencies. Number two, Along the same lines, our internally managed affordable housing loan program, running 30 years strong, has helped defend against the rate rises this quarter, as we were down negative 2.26%. This continues to demonstrate that you can do well over the long term through impact investing. 
And then three, holding cash as an asset helped ever so slightly. So what can you tell me about what hurt the portfolio? Yeah, fixed income not being negatively correlated to equities like it typically is. Usually when equities go down, fixed income will go up. Also, our overweight to high yield when the high yield index was down about 9.8%. Our two managers, Capital Group and Oak Tree, were down about 9.5% in this space, both outperforming their indices. Lastly, being exposed to emerging markets when the USD continues to be strong has hurt fixed income issues in local currencies. So the Inflation Protection Fund seems to have outsized relative returns. What can you tell me about this? And if inflation is so high, how come performance is negative? Well, the outsized returns come from the fact that we have a significant underweight, 30%, to United Kingdom inflation-linked bonds. These bonds as a segment were down 18% for the quarter. Let's decouple, though, inflation from performance for a moment. We hear about inflation in our daily lives through the Consumer Price Index. The year-over-year -year change in the basket of goods and services is up 9.1% ending in June. We're basically talking, though, about two different periods. One, the CPI is measured year-over-year. -year. I'm specifically speaking to a change in the quarter. Commodities are certainly up year-over-year, -year, but our manager, Gresham, was down 3.3% while outperforming its benchmark by 2.4% due to an overweight in energy. I will finish by noting that U.S. tips were down about 7% and global inflation-linked bonds were down about 6.4%. I end the performance section but want to acknowledge many headwinds. Even with consumer confidence at an all-time low, this may not be the end of more market declines. However, maintaining diversification across many different asset classes should help provide support. When certain areas go down, other areas should go up. If your organization would like to discuss more, Westpath is here to help and provide reassurances throughout this challenging time. Thanks for the performance update, Evan. Thanks for sitting down with me today, Dave, to provide what's sure to be a packed economic update. Happy to be here with you, Joe. So Dave, it appears that the market is saying that the Fed's aggressive response to what seems like persistently high inflation will inevitably lead to recession. Is it true that recession is right around the corner? Yeah, well, Joe, it depends on one's definition of recession. A commonly held belief is that recession occurs when the economy is contracted for two consecutive quarters. And for the first quarter this year, the Labor Department's Bureau of Economic Analysis reported that negative real economic growth of one and a half percent. So let me stop there real quick, Dave. What do you mean by real economic growth? So I'm glad you asked, Joe, because whenever we talk about GDP or gross domestic product, we're always talking about the, how the economy is doing on an inflation-adjusted basis. Growth occurs when the economy produces more goods and services. So when we say that GDP, GDP growth was 2%, we're saying that the economy produced 2% more goods and services than it did in the prior period, irrespective of any price increases charged for those goods and services. So now, as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, as of July 8th, the Atlanta Federal Reserve is forecasting that the economy contracted in the second quarter by 1.2%, meaning that we produced less stuff and provided fewer services than we did in the prior quarter. Hence, if the Atlanta Fed is correct, and if we believe the commonly understood definition, then we're already in a recession. The right hand of the chart shows the evolution of full year GDP growth based on the forecasts of over 70 business and financial economists that are surveyed by the Wall Street Journal. And over the span of just a few short months, they've lowered their collective 2022 GDP growth forecast from about 3.6% to just under 1.3%. And I'll have more to say about forecasting a little later. Now, however, according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth is not an official definition. In the U.S., we rely on the independent, private, nonprofit National Bureau of Economic Research to declare when the U.S. is in a recession. 
they consider numerous factors in reaching such a decision, including employment conditions, personal income, and industrial production. So the BEA states that while negative GDP growth and recessions closely track each other, the consideration by the NBER of the monthly indicators, especially employment, means that two consecutive quarters of negative GD growth does not always hold. So then since we continue to see positive employment data, we shouldn't even be talking about a recession even if the economy contracted in the second quarter, correct? Yeah, that's right, Joe. Let's look at some employment data. The first chart looks at the number of Americans employed since 2000. During the last 22 years, we've had three recessions as indicated by the three shaded areas in this chart. The first occurred after the tech bubble burst at the turn of the century. The second after the housing bubble burst in 2008, a period that we now refer to as the Great Recession. The third was the steep economic downturn caused by the pandemic that we recently experienced. In each of these cases, America lost jobs. And in the case of the pandemic, the job losses were massive. But as you can see, Joe, the number of Americans employed continues to move higher, with 372,000 jobs added in June, which is about the same number of jobs that were added in April and May. Now, while this slide looks at the total number of people employed, let's take a look at two other measures of the health of the jobs market. The chart on the left shows the unemployment rate, which has held steady at 3.6% for the last four months. What's important to note, Joe, is that there have only been four months in the last 50 years when the unemployment rate has been lower than 3.6%. Just four months in 50 years. A second measure of the health of the jobs market is the number of people that have lost their jobs and filed a claim for unemployment insurance. The chart on the right looks at total initial unemployment claims for the last week of June for the past 10 years. Unemployment claims tend to be cyclical, so I wanted to do a true apples to apples comparison, which is why I chose the June data. Also, I intentionally excluded June 2020 because there were so many people out of work then that the number would be way off the chart. The June number equals claims filed in 2018, which was the lowest number on the chart. To find a lower end of June number, you'd have to go all the way back to 1969, and that was when the workforce was much smaller than it is today. Now certainly, all that can change over the next few months, and candidly, we've heard a number of stories over the last several weeks of companies laying off people. So the jury is still out on the unemployment picture. Uh, but as you can see on the next chart show, we still have boatloads of jobs that are available. While not at levels a couple of months back, there remains over 11 million jobs that haven't been filled. Notice the headline on the right of this slide. The story reports that most layoffs are contained to crypto and real estate and that recruiters are aggressively pursuing candidates by checking websites that announce companies laying people off. Hence, if employment is strong, which is certainly the case today, I think it's premature to declare that we're in a recession. Now, I will add that the Federal Reserve has been very aggressive in raising interest rates, and so that could have a negative impact on empl employment. But we'll wait and see what impact that does have. Okay, so I, I get that the employment picture is great, but what I don't understand is why we're seeing this negative economic growth in a period of strong employment. I imagine we have many viewers that are confused as why the economy appears to have stalled. Yeah, Joe, um, in fact, I was confused about that as well. Um, so at the risk of getting a bit wonky on our viewers, let me try and explain. I'll start out with a chart that looks at the components of GDP and what contributes to economic growth. On the left, you can see the consumer spending, which the government refers to as personal consumption expenditures, makes up over two-thirds of our economy. Government accounts for about a sixth, and business investment accounts for about an eighth. There are a couple of other minor factors that are included as well. Now, while these segments of the economy can contribute to growth at various rates over short periods, 
there are only two factors that contribute to growth over the long term. That's the growth in the workforce, that is more people making more stuff or providing more services, and productivity, when workers use better machines and more efficient processes to make more stuff with the same effort. We know that the workforce is growing much slower than it has historically. So absent any major shifts in productivity, we really can't count on economic growth being better than 2% going forward. Now, remember what I said a minute ago about consumer spending making up two-thirds of the economy. Here, we see a chart that shows the pace of consumer spending. While there was a big drop-off during the pandemic, we saw a sharp rebound that appears a meaningfully above trend. However, the numbers you see on the slide are not inflation adjusted. And remember what I said at the beginning of our discussion, Joe, we adjust for inflation when determining an economic growth. So now let's look what consumer spending looks like when we adjust for inflation. The chart on the right shows that presently, consumer spending adjusted for inflation is slightly below trend. Americans are definitely spending more, but we aren't buying as much because of the erosion of purchasing power caused by inflation. That makes sense, Dave. So the economy is shrinking because of inflation. We've heard a lot about the reasons for why we've had inflation. A major change in what consumers are buying, China's zero COVID policy, supply chain problems, and Russia's war in Ukraine. Are there any other reasons why we're seeing inflation at nearly 9% today? Yeah, well, in fact, Joe, inflation came out yesterday at over 9%. And you bet, while there, all the factors you mentioned certainly played a role, there's one you didn't mention that I think is the biggest factor of all. And I'll explain in a series of three charts on this next slide. So remember, consumer spending is the major driver of economic growth. And what drives growth in consumer spending? Growth in income. On this first chart, we're looking at the 37-year period up until 1995, when total real or inflation-adjusted personal income grew at a compounded annual rate of about 3.6%. It's important that I define personal income. Not only is it comprised of wages earned by workers, but personal income also includes social security payments, unemployment insurance, and any other type of government assistance to individuals. Notice this brief period in the early 80s when the growth in real wages was below trend. So why do you think that was, Joe? My guess is that's the last time we had a period of very high inflation. Exactly. But the growth in wages soon recovered, and we were back on trend. Now let's look at the 18 years from 1996 to 2013. By this time, the growth in the workforce was slowing compared to the prior period. So growth in incomes during the period was a full percentage point lower. We had two periods where incomes grew above trend. The first was concurrent with the tech wave and the second was concurrent with the housing bubble. But then the great financial crisis hit, and with it a sluggish economy in which income growth remained below trend for several years, absent some government stimulus, which were represented by these two spikes that you see. So now let's take a look at the past nine years, and this is where it really gets interesting. Look at those huge spikes in 2020 and 2021. Of course, we know that those spikes were a result of the massive government stimulus resulting from the pandemic. The government paid out way more than needed to keep personal income on trend, way more. And it's no wonder that we've seen inflation for everything from cars to food to housing to Bitcoin to meme stocks to even regular stocks. The federal government gave American boatloads of cash and we spent and invested it, driving up prices across the board. And this, I believe, is the main reason why we have the inflation that we do today. We will eventually return to equilibrium, but that may take a few months or perhaps a few years. Now, there's one more chart, Joe, that I would like to present related to the U.S. economy, and that's the state of the housing market. 
The chart on the left shows the progression of housing prices over the last 17 years in relationship to wage growth. The average wage for rank and file employees is currently about $27.50 an hour. And while wages have a little more than doubled over this period, the price of the average home is three and a half times what it was in 1996. The table on the right displays the dramatic increases we've seen in select cities just over the past year. And it seems to me that the lack of affordable housing could be another factor that might also interfere with the return to economic normalcy. So Dave, we mostly talked about the U.S. economy so far. Let's, let's briefly shift gears and talk about economic conditions overseas. What are you seeing that might be of interest to our viewers? So there have been a lot of interesting developments internationally over the past few months, and some are well known and others less so. We're all aware of the impact of China's ongoing zero COVID policies and the impact it's had on economic growth in China and the resulting supply chain issues that affected the U.S. and other countries. We all remain disheartened by the ongoing war in Ukraine and the impact it's had on European energy prices and then food prices more generally. Britain is going through a period of political turmoil with its prime minister having resigned last week. A headline that recently captured my attention discussed how Germany experienced its first month of a trade deficit in over 30 years. The story attributed this to higher prices for imported food and energy as well as lower demand coming from China. I was also surprised to recently learn that the Japanese yen depreciated over 30 percent against the dollar over the last year and a half. Now, the main reason given is that the Bank of Japan has continued with its loose monetary policy, whereas you had stated earlier, Joe, our Federal Reserve is aggressively increasing interest rates to fight inflation. And I should note that inflation in Japan does remain considerably lower than that in the U.S. at about 2.5%. So bottom line, while there may be many different reasons, the economies of most countries are struggling. So Dave, it seems like you've painted a pretty gloomy picture with high inflation, below trend employment growth, the cost of housing beyond reach of many Americans, and far from robust economic conditions overseas. What implications does this have for the stock markets and how do you think stocks will perform from here? Well, Joe, as you know, we don't try and predict the direction of the stock market. Last week on my four hour flight back uh, home, I reread one of the great papers I've saved over the years written by a division of German insurance giant Allianz, and it was back in 2005 they wrote it. The title of this paper was The Seven Sins of Fund Management, and it's patterned after the seven deadly sins that we've all heard about. The first sin is forecasting left, led with the headline, The Folly of Forecasting Ignore all economists, strategists, and analysts. The paper quotes Lao Tzu, a 6th century BC Chinese philosopher who observed, and I quote, those who have knowledge don't predict, and those who predict don't have knowledge. Hence, I have no problem saying that I don't know how the markets will perform in the near term. But what gives me some comfort is some evidence that markets may have reached bottom. The first is the common valuation metric of the price earnings ratio. This chart on the left looks at the current aggregate price of the top 50 mega cap stocks compared to analysts' expected earnings over the next 12 months. And while PE ratios have come down, they remain above their 20 plus year average. And as you heard in our fund review from Evan, Westpath underweights the mega cap stocks, so I'm comfortable that we remain underweight those stocks. The chart on the right shows the P.E. ratio for the small cap companies, and it appears meaningfully below its 20-year average. Sure, it has been lower, and I'm not predicting that it can't go lower compared to where it is today, but I do think that history has also shown that stocks often rebound soon after lows, so I have no reason to believe we won't eventually see a rebound. This next slide looks at PE valuations for developed international stocks on the left and emerging country stocks on the right. Here too, both indexes are trading below their averages. 
Now, I suppose I need to emphasize that these two charts are both based on analyst earnings forecasts, and you know what I said about forecasting. Hence, investors will be paying close attention to the upcoming earnings reporting season to assess the extent to which earnings expectations will come down and whether the attractive valuations I just presented will disappear. Now, the second piece of evidence is like a recent blog posted by our colleague Frank Holstein, where he explored the idea that negative consumer sentiment can be a positive market indicator. This next chart looks at individual investor psychology. Now, I realize, Joe, that this looks a bit complicated, um, and especially showing it near the end of our webinar. Each week, the American Association of Individual Investors conducts a survey of investor sentiment. Each one of the dots on the slide represents the difference between the percentage of investors who are bullish, that is, they have a positive view of the stock market, and the percentage of investors who are bearish or have a negative view of the market. I selected what appeared to me to be the five biggest outliers representing the five weeks over the last 20 years when investors were most negative on stocks. I then looked at when did the stock market reach bottom and how stocks performed over the subsequent year. So for example, if we look at the far left of the chart on October 16, 1992, the number of investors with a negative view of the market exceeded those with a positive view by 36 percentage points. Unsurprisingly, that week defined the market bottom, and stocks advanced 17% over the next year. And you can see how the other market performed for the other periods. We did reach maximum bearishness at the end of April, and we can't say for certain if the market has reached bottom since then, so we don't know if this time is different. But if history is a reasonable guide, then one might optimistically expect better days ahead. So I think that concludes my economic update, Joe. Uh, thank you. Thanks for your thoughts, Dave. It's a great discussion on a complex and changing investment landscape. Thanks for tuning in today. If you have any questions, please contact, contact us at investmentinfo at westpath.org. We will continue to closely monitor ongoing market volatility and economic factors. We hope our investors take comfort in the fact that Westpath continues to maintain a disciplined strategy of managing diversified investments.